Hey there, welcome to the Unnecessary Nonsense Podcast YouTube channel and apparently worldwide headquarters where we apparently have lighting and professional attire for this t for this particular video. I wouldn't get too used to it if you've seen anything else on this channel, but thumbs up if you like semi-professional looking things. So if you're watching this video, you probably heard about the news story that broke yesterday and has been picked up by some various news outlets today. I did want to talk about it a little bit and kind of... Um, Wade through what little there is out there. There's a lot that still hasn't been said about it, and I think more is going to come out as time goes on. But I kind of want to sift through a little bit of the headline grabbing. Obviously, you may have heard, you may or may not have heard that the Alliance of American Football, the AAF, has received a commitment from current Carolina Hurricanes owner Tom Dundon for 250 million dollars, where presumably he gets kind of an equity stake in the league. And obviously, the AAF is positioning this as an investment in the league, which it, it is, technically. And obviously, a lot of news outlets have taken the kind of the more negative angle, which kind of plays into it. I did read the Athletic article that kind of broke this, more or less. And I'll give kind of my thoughts. I'm not going to read you the whole article, because that wouldn't be very interesting. But at the same time, I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis and then kind of give my own two cents on it. Right now, it's still kind of early to speculate more than at the bare level. I will speculate a little bit and talk about what I'm seeing based on what I've done. Let me turn on the brightness on that a little bit. But I'll kind of give my two cents on what I've seen there and take the little bits and pieces that we have so far and try to make some sense of it. And by the way, this particular video, this is very much an open conversation. There isn't a lot out there, but I'd love to hear any thoughts you might have and hit the thumbs up. So really quick, high level, as I said, there is a $250 million investment that has been made by Tom Dundon, uh, currently owner of the care at least part owner of the Carolina Hurricanes, and billionaire otherwise. So the way it's been kind of angled as far as headlines are concerned is, you know, exemplified by a USA Today article, which was more of an opinion piece, where it says, opinion, no surprise, the AF already finds itself in trouble. That's a bit of lazy reporting. Like, there's really nothing, there's really nothing that is, in, that is insinuated that this was kind of a guaranteed thing to happen, or that it necessarily leads into something else. Depending on how you want to look at this, this is the glass half full, glass half empty kind of thing. I'm going to take the more glass half full kind of angle on this, but the truth is, anything can happen from here. There are some elements of it that, uh, that kind of stand up to me, and also it kind of gives me a little bit of perspective on a few questions that I had as we've gone into it. On the field product, I've talked about the AAF, where I'm actually pretty satisfied where they are on the field. It's the off the field and kind of the logistics and financial end of it where now the questions are going to be brought up by, by some people. Right now it's kind of early days because obviously this is the first that's been heard of it. But I think the AAF kind of made a mistake. Regardless of how this actually came about, they did make a mistake on kind of allowing this to come out in this way. So even though they're trying to spin it in a certain way, certain outlets of the media are going to spin it in another way. As I said, I'm not going to read you the whole athletic article, but let me give you a couple of points straight from the article, just so that we're, we're on the same page. So according to sources, there was one enormous problem, one that became obvious before the AF's second weekend. The league was running short on cash and quickly. Without new investors, there was a good chance it was going to miss payroll last Friday. So that's kind of the big headline piece. The potential that they were going to miss payroll. And then obviously you connect the $250 million part with it with payroll. Well, the thing is, unless they're paying the coaches, general managers, and staff a lot more than you would think, if I did my really rudimentary math correctly, I'm thinking, I think there's about four or 500 players in the league. The salaries are capped at 70000 So what you're talking about there with that really crude math is about $35 million in payroll. Well, if you're paying them even weekly over the 10-week schedule, I don't know how they break down the, the contracts. I don't have one in front of me. I couldn't tell you. But even if you broke it up over 10, you'd be talking about a $3.5 million. Uh, you know, you need th about $3.5 million in order to make payroll for the players. And then obviously you've got staff and coaches and everything related to it. Obviously it would be more. But regardless, it's not a ridiculous sum of money. The $250 million, I'm sure, is not all going to payroll. I don't think the USA Today and those other articles, they're not lying to you when they say that if they were in any danger of being potentially shortfall, I believe that probably they were sh running short on cash, but I also believe that some of the other elements don't quite fall into place if you're trying to make it out as sounding like like a desperate infusion of cash. But I'll, put in, uh, I'll continue with the article a little bit here. Without a new nine-figure investor, nobody was sure what would have happened, one source said. You can always tell people their checks are going to be a little late, but how many are going to show up on the weekend for games when they don't see anything hit their bank accounts on Friday? So 
I'm not going to disagree with this. It, it's a reasonable statement to make. Um, what I'll say from this standpoint is, from what I see, from what little there is here, I can see that Tom Dundon is probably looking at this as an investment. What that means, though, is that you're not going to make a $250 million, even if you think you're, able, you're in a position to be able to get more equity for less. Regardless, if you think the league's going to lose money, you're not going to invest in it. Someone doesn't become a billionaire first by being dumb, and second by throwing $250 million at something that you're really not sure about. You, you, there's taking risks, and then there's being dumb. I don't think you're going to throw that much money into something where you feel like you're really gambling. You have to feel like you you can bring something to the table, maybe connections, maybe uh, business, maybe your own infrastructure that can you think you can probably make a go of it and take take it from where it's gotten to this point and take it somewhere better. At the same time, though, you're also not where I think some of the headlines are a little bit misleading is that it makes it sound like it was thrown together desperately at the last moment. I believe that the timing on it is not a mistake. If they were running short on cash, then I'm sure they had an urgency to try to get this done. But at the same time, I also think that if you're doing any kind of diligence at all, this conversation was probably going on for a while before they were able to come to a deal of this size in order to even sell an equity stake in the league. And obviously, we're missing most of the details in how this is going to be structured, what exactly Tom Dundon's role is going to be in the league, and if, if anything, what he would be doing as far as maybe changing some aspects of it, bringing marketing in. What I will also say is that the, the league is in, a, in an early stage. So the question really becomes, from this current standpoint, is regardless of whether they needed the cash immediately or not, regardless of whether they're in danger of missing payroll or not, the question then becomes, how much money was originally put into it by the initial investors? And then how long have they, been, how long have they known that they felt they were in kind of a shortfall situation where they might be in a little bit of trouble if they didn't have another influx of cash coming. The only concern that I would have is if you knew that it was coming, why weren't you already kind of making these moves a little bit sooner? Rather than one person making this big investment, which is fine, why weren't you kind of moving around uh, a little bit of cash beforehand? The other aspect that kind of that this makes me think of is some of the questions I had not about the unfilled product, but maybe about the marketing a little bit. So you didn't want to overhype it, which makes sense. But then my question that I would pose is, the website for the AAF is a solid website. It's functional, but it's a little bit rudimentary. One thing that I've kind of made note and that I've said on the podcast when I talk about it is that it feels like it's it's a set of templates. You can rotate through so the webmaster can flip between them. So when it's game day, you flip this one on. So you've got the video playing at the top, and then you've got the the score and the plays and everything. It works. It's functional. But it's one of those things where you've already got the model for a professional sports league of how you can have interactive, you know, scoreboards and that kind of thing. It's out there. So the question is, why didn't you already have something like that out there? Was it a case of not trying to be cheap, but trying to not necessarily invest the money into it up front? Along the same lines, some of the communication as far as the app wasn't ready until effectively the day before or two days before the actual games got started. Which, again, is not necessarily an issue, but knowing how much you emphasis you put on the app, why wouldn't you have had it ready beforehand? Was there an issue with having enough people working on it? Again, that's what I'm saying. This is pure speculation on my part, but it just kind of, it leads me to question certain aspects of it, and then it makes you kind of think a little bit. Does one thing have to do with the other? The other aspect that I would also question is once the app came out, again, the app is functional. I've used it and played around with it a little bit. It's fine. It does, it does its job but it still feels like it was lacking a little bit in features. That doesn't mean you're not going to get them now. Potentially with having this influx of cash, it means you could get the additional people working on these different things to get it up to, to kind of the level that you would hope for. And that can only be a positive going forward. The fact that the league owns all the teams also means that even if attendance is flagging in one or two markets or three markets, if you can start building up some of the other markets, so, so like for example, San Antonio right now, attendance-wise, was the was by far and away the best attended of the teams in the first two weeks. Well, if San Antonio can be solidified as a market, and then maybe you can do well in Orlando, and maybe you can do well in a couple of the other markets, you can have a couple that are straggling, straggling behind a little bit for a little while. Not forever, you still want to be able to draw attendance, but in 2019, any kind of sports league that you're going to create of any kind, whether it's a minor league or whether it's a major league or whatever the case is, you probably shouldn't be relying for the gate, because... People have so many options. They can watch things on television. They can st the streaming services. That's all out there. 
in theory, you should probably be not relying, but you more of the emphasis. And again, this is where the question is going to be, and unfortunately, we don't have the answers. The question is going to be, as far as the revenue model, how much were they actually getting from their TV deals? So they have a, you know, a deal where they work with CBS, where they'll air some games on CBS. Obviously, the first week they had a game on CBS, and the, the playoffs and the championship game, I believe, is going to be on CBS. So they have some kind of a deal. So is it that CBS is offering a little bit of money here? So what kind of actual cash incentive was it? Were they actually getting that? Was there any kind of a delay in revenues coming in? Were they expecting more? These are the questions that you end up having to kind of answer, which is unfortunate in these early stages. It is going to make some people question a little bit. Uh, fortunately, I think there is some enthusiasm and there is an appetite for additional football. So the question is going to be whether that appetite can hold up in the early stages because you can paint it in the best light that you can. And I think in the long run, one way or the other, I think there's, a, there's room in the marketplace for another football league that isn't necessarily competing with the NFL, but tries to, contri to contribute to a niche in the marketplace during the offseason. There are players who probably could serve to do well and to be able to play in this league in the long run, and other players who have aspirations to go to the NFL level where they can get that. That developmental piece of it, I think, has value. So it's possible that the NFL may be interested in it in some way, but if your business model is to become a feeder for the NFL, that's kind of a tricky business model to have, unless you had it in writing in the first place, which I don't think they do. At the same time, I really don't think Tom Dundon is going to invest in it without at least having some idea of how he would monetize it and generate some kind of revenue. Again, I don't think you can rely on the gate. It's, it, it'll be a portion of it. I don't think you can rely on jersey sales or merchandise sales, although that's going to contribute. I think you still need to have something in place where those broadcasting rights have to be worth something. Looking at the NFL, which is the most extreme example, even if nobody attended any NFL games, I think the NFL, more than likely, with the amount of revenue coming in from those TV deals, would probably still be profitable. That's, that's something that you'd have to work out financially. You can, you can, of course, argue with me on that point. But the point is that TV money is so huge. The AF shouldn't expect anything resembling that. But the truth is, you should be getting enough from TV money to at least make it viable. You should be able to live with relatively sparse attendance at first, which then hopefully you would build up as you got more of a foothold in those communities. So I'm not going to speculate much more on that, but those are kind of the thoughts that I had. What happens now if it turns out that it was just kind of a, a lacking and they were trying to be very conservative to try to, keep, to try to stretch the money until they had that investment? Well, now presumably they have the investment. So now what are you going to do with it? It can't just be all going to payroll because that's not going to get you anywhere. Does the infrastructure improve? Uh, from my standpoint in Canada, does that mean we have international shipping? Because I know for a fact they don't have it. It's not a big deal, obviously. I don't think losing those uh, merchandise international dollars is going to be a make or break, but it's, it's just a source of revenue you don't have. So then are you going to be able to build up that infrastructure so things like that become possible? Does the app improve? Does the website improve? Do you get more PR people and marketing people to help the communications portion of it? Those are all really questions, but it's, it's something that's kind of worth thinking about. Uh, one last point I'll make here. I'm just taking a look here to see if there's anything else. One valid point they also make here is obviously you've got your big name coaches, your Steve Spurriers and whatnot. I'm assuming they're making a decent amount, but again, that shouldn't be a make or break. You shouldn't, if you've tried to control costs everywhere, presumably, what's going to end up being the most interesting part is once Tom Dundon comes in and presumably has some access to be able to then tailor the infrastructure, is he going to make any changes from that standpoint? Because going forward, you're going to want to maintain that cost control, but you're still going to want to grow what you have. So at least for the moment being, you still have some goodwill, the on-field product. There's mixed reviews, but at the same time, there is positive there. Some people are interested. Maintaining them is going to be a matter of whether you can see that steady improvement. At the same time, you're going to have to convince people now a little bit that you're going to be financially viable. They're going to want to be able to make sure that if they invest money in the tickets for week 6, week 7, week 8, week 9, week 10, that there's still going to be a week 7, 8, 9, and 10. So that's kind of where I'm at as far as it... Uh, there's not much more I can add, so hopefully this kind of at least sparks some conversation. If you haven't heard about it, I'll try to put a link in the description of um, probably the least clickbaity uh, headline if I can find one. Otherwise, um, it's just a conversation. Uh, what are your thoughts, if you have any, on uh, on this story? And do you think it leads to anything? Is it is it an urgent situation where the AAF has an issue, or is it a case of they tried to stretch things as far as they could go, but they needed that investment regardless? And 
did they already move forward without having it you know in place there's a lot of little questions and it's going to be something that hopefully will come out over time and if anything else comes of it then uh, we'll be speaking about it with my with my co-host on the podcast on this channel on iTunes on Spotify and on whatever other podcast app you happen to have so thanks for listening if you got to the end of the video I appreciate you and then we'll see you next time